Praise the Lord in Jesus' name. Everybody stand on your feet and give God some glory this morning. He is worthy. Hallelujah. He is worthy. Lord, we thank you. We thank you, Father. We thank you for this time. Father God, we thank you for being God. We thank you for being Jehovah Jireh, for being Jehovah Nisi. Father, we thank you for having your spirit here when we came here today, oh God. Father God, we thank you that you that we trusted you with your word and you sent it for, for what it's supposed to do, oh God. Father, we thank you for all those who are listening here today, that you send the word and let the word do what it's supposed to do in their lives. Father God, we thank you that the word that will be sent today will be seed and will fall upon fertile ground. In Jesus' name, amen. We're giving honor to God this morning, who is the head of my life, who is the lover of my soul. Give honor to Overseer Davis and Co-Pastor Davis and Sister Pastor and all the saints of God this morning. Praise the Lord in Jesus' name. I'm excited about the word today. I'm excited about I'm excited about Jesus in general. 24-7, 365. If you're not excited about him, I don't know what to tell you. You better get excited. Hallelujah. You better get excited. Amen. Amen. We're not going to be before you long. You know, I was um, praying about, Lord, what is it that you want the people of God to hear this morning? And not just the people of God, but people in general. Who who is going is this going to benefit? And so we were starting a series and I said, I, I want to save that for the series. But the Lord said, no started today. So we're coming, we're going to talk to you today. The title is The Spirit of a Karen. Everybody hears about the Karen. She became well known and popular, especially during the highest peak of COVID. But really, Karen has been around for a long time. And it's not so much a person, it's the spirit. We can coin phrase things, you know, but it's the spirit of Karen. And we're going to attack that today and prayerfully not just attack it, address it, and send it back to the pit of hell where it came from. So the thought we're dealing with today is part of the fifth commandment. You know, there's 10 commandments. People like to call them the, call them the, the commandments of Moses or the Moses commandment. But these are the 10 commandments. This is the fifth one. And sometimes we need to go back and read those commandments to remind us that they're still in place in this dispensation. I know murder is, I know lying is, I know cheating is, I know homosexuality is. So this one right here is very much in place. We're dealing with obeying our parents. Ooh. Oh yeah, obeying our parents. So when we look at things in the world, we kind of figure out why is all these things happening? Children being shot and killed. Uh, shooters going into Walmart stores and, and, and schools, sh- having mass shootings all over the place. People stealing, no regard for people, no regard for human beings. I thought about that and I was praying about it and the Holy Spirit said, they forgot my commandment. They forgot my commandment. Everything comes from something. Everything has a derivative. No matter what it is, it com- it's a root of something, either something or the lack of something. And I can speak to you in, in the sense of a heart of cultures. If something doesn't grow right, the first thing I look at it and say, are the root, is the root system disconnected from the base of what it's supposed to be? Because of how it looks and the indication of how it looks, maybe leaves might look funny or crinkly or smells a certain way, that'll give me an indicator that that root system is either disconnected or stressed. So as I look at the analysis of it, then I have to figure out what do I need to do to take the stress off of it so that that plant or that tree can reconnect and have a healthy root system so that it can produce what it's supposed to produce. If I don't do that, it may produce something, but it may not be something that's healthy. It may be an off seed. It may be a sapling. And a sapling is not always a strong and true plant. See, everything comes from a genius plant. And the genius plant is the original. It's the original thing. And then everything else comes from that. 
So when we look at trees and fruit trees, we see the little flowers on them. The flowers produce the fruit. And if something is wrong with the flower, then the fruit is not going to be edible and good for you. You cannot use it. It's either going to be bitter or it's going to wither away and the birds won't even eat it. They'll leave it to the canker worms to eat. They'll leave it to the canker worms to eat. This, this world has left things to the canker worms to eat. So the spirit of Karen, we see her all the time. I ran into one. I, was, I have to confess, I was locked and loaded. I was ready. I wanted Karen to come talk to me. I got something for you. But I watched the Karen. I see her. You know, I see her. I see her on my job. Where does, where does she come from? Yeah. See, she started when she was born. Mm -hmm. We have to remember in the Garden of Eden, God put everything in Eden that they needed. Everything was perfect, even birth. When Mary carried Jesus, he was perfect. Her womb protected her, protected him, and everything that he needed was nourished within her womb. And while he was in her womb, being Jesus, he really didn't need to be protected. But see, he came in the form of a man. So we had so they had to let the natural process take its course. So his her womb protected him. But can you imagine just for a minute the things that he may have ministered to her being Jesus? That's heavy. I think about things like that. What did Mary, what revelations did Mary get? While she was carrying Jesus. I don't want to get ahead of myself. So everything was perfect in Eden. Until sin entered in. And when sin entered in. That's when we went down the slippery slope. Karen was introduced in the Garden of Eden. The spirit of disobedience. Mm -hmm. The Bible says. In Exodus 20 and 12. Honor your mother and father. Honor your mother and father that your days may be long upon the land which the Lord your God is giving you. I'm going to repeat that part. That your days may be long upon the land which the Lord God has given you. So everybody who's born, days are numbered and ordained. That he's given us every number. But part of that number is honoring your parents, your mother and your father. Yeah. I know some of you all are thinking, what if they weren't good parents? We're going to deal with that. Because when God ordains something, that is what he means. But he also is a considerate God. He's a considerate God. He's very considerate. If you are a young person listening or here in the, in the congregation this morning, no matter how many ups and downs and disagreements you have with your parents, you have to honor them. My father is gone because I'm still living. I have to honor him. I have to honor the things he placed in me. I have to honor his life. I have to honor his memory. I have to honor the man of God that he was. I still have to honor him. I don't get a chance to be disconnected. Why does God add the promise? The scripture talks about the promise, the promise, the promise. In the fifth commandment, the fifth commandment is rooted and structured in creation. It is rooted and structured in creation. God has given authority in various offices within the, within the structure of creation. He ordered one of those offices of the parent. That's what he ordered. The family was built on the fabric of creation from the beginning with Adam and Eve. They were given the mandate to be fruitful and multiply. That's Genesis 128. So they already gave the commandment. God said, this is what I want. This is what he created in his mind. This, and before, when he created in his mind, he created it naturally, tangibly. So now we have to ask the question, why do we obey our parents? Because our parents are representative of God. He entrusted parents 
to oversee their children and to raise them in the fear and admiration of God. The fear and admiration of God, not the fear of parents in the form of abuse, but to fear them because they are representatives of God. So, Neo, what if my parent was a good parent? What if my parent was an abuser? Do I still honor them? God says, yes, you honor them. He didn't, he didn't say condition upon how they treat you. He didn't say that. He said you honor them. He will deal with them of what type of parents they were. Because remember, we all have to stand before God and give an account. Can he separate you from that parent to protect you? Absolutely. Absolutely. What we what about grandparents? We're gonna talk about grandparents too. Are we going there? We're gonna talk about grandparents. We're gonna talk about uh our seniors, our elderly who get abused. Because let me tell you something, my father in heaven is not an abuser. He's a perfect man. He doesn't abuse anything. Everything he's made is good and perfect. Everything, everything he's made is good and perfect. So honoring our parents through love and respect to regard them as God's representatives. They are God's representatives. I find it interesting how we will obey our teachers, some of us. We'll obey our pastors, some of us. We'll obey other people, but we won't obey our parents. How can you follow instructions on your job? How can you follow instructions in the body of Christ? How can you follow instructions in other areas of your life if you don't follow the first instruction? The first person who teaches us is our parents. We learn, if, if, you, if you're raised in a, in a, in a Christian house, you, you learn to Pray, those those foundations are laid down for you, those principles. You learn, some of us may learn the Ten Commandments, but one thing we'll learn is you don't obey your parents, it's a consequence. Your hind tail might not be able to sit down so easily, which God ordained too. So when we hear parents talk about, oh, it's abuse. No, it's a difference between disciplining and abuse. The Bible says foolishness is bound up in the heart of a child, but the rod of correction will drive it away. That rod means a stick. Boom. Tag that behind. The Bible says that a parent that does not discipline their child doesn't love them. It really says beat. That's what it says. Because it's important for the order. It is important that as parents, we protect you from yourself and from the world. We have to prepare you. And no, you can't have it your way. It can't, we can't. So when we see all of the foolery going on, I don't want to do and then want to question a thousand questions as parents. We need to step back for a minute and evaluate ourselves as parents. Why am I allowing all this leeway in my house? Why am I allowing all this conversation to go on in my house? Because we don't understand these principles. See, the principles go both ways. Parents. Raise up your children in the fear and admiration of God. Parents, children, respect your parents. Obey them. Obey them. This is the promise. First Peter 2 and 13 says, submit yourselves for the Lord's sake to every authority, amen, among men, whether to the king as a, as a superior authority or to the governors who sit, who, who were sent by him to punish those who do wrong and to the command those who do right. So we, this talking about government now, government. So he's given us the order. First we obey God. Then we obey our parents. Now, Hopefully our parents have put everything in us that we're supposed to have. That we have to obey the land of the law. This is biblical. So now when the enemy comes to twist it, distort it, and tell you, you can make up your mind as a nine-year-old to do what you want to do. So if your mother spank you, you have the right to call the police on her. The devil is a lie. If your father says, I'm going to take something from you, 
and you're going to have a temper tantrum and go tell on him the devil is a lie. When your teacher says be quiet in your classroom and you want to show out to be the class clown and the and the, the school system has said, oh, our children, we just want them to be free thinkers. <laughs> That's what we want them to be. We want them to be free thinkers. What they're really saying is we don't want to be responsible for them in our presence and in our care. So we just don't let them run amok because they make me feel uncomfortable because I'm afraid of them. Because parents have punked out and not done their jobs. We have drank the purple, pink, blue, yellow, green Kool-Aid. How does a child come home and tell their mother or father, I decided I don't want to be a little boy. I'm going to be a little girl. And we're supposed to be okay with that. Because my teacher said so. So we give them more authority to a teacher over our child than we are over to God. God is going to discipline you parents for that. Children, God is going to discipline you for going against the will and the instructions of your parents. When you lie, you go against the instructions of your will and your parents. You go against the instructions of God. God says, don't lie. Don't steal. Don't have hatred in your heart. When, it, when are children, uh, what age are children held accountable? When they can understand yes and no, right from wrong. Don't touch that stove. It's hot. When they can say it's hot, it's hot. They're accountable for understanding. They're accountable for understanding. That stove is hot. We made it to the first step. So every part of their lives their steps and accountability. When they conquer that portion of their lives, they're accountable. We have this preconceived idea it's because we just love people that every young person, unfortunately, that loses their lives at such a young age, they automatically to go to heaven. The Bible says God searches and, and, and judges us by our heart what we would have heard and what we would have done what we heard. Yes, it is sad it is heartbreaking when we see young people who have lost their lives, gunned down innocently. But the spirit of Karen is pervasive. When Karen can stand at a counter and throw pop on somebody and scream and yell and have her temper tantrum. See, I'm going to tell you where it comes from. When they're little people like this, as my dad would say, knee high to a tadpole. And they go to mommy and say, they go to daddy and say, daddy, can I have some crackers? And daddy say, no. Then they run into mommy. And they say, mommy. Daddy said, I can't have any crackers. And then mommy says, well, go back and ask him again and just cry. and He'll give it to you. What? Oh, y'all don't think it starts there? That's where it starts. And in some culture, that is the practice. So, so little one goes back to daddy and just has a meltdown. And what does dad do? Okay, I don't want you to cry. It's okay. He, it's just a crack. It's just an innocent crack. I'll just get, here you go. Whatever I want. But just, just for now, it's okay. See, in, my, in our mind, we think it's just okay for this time. What's going Now, the next time, she don't even go to mommy. She just goes straight to daddy. She used to stand in front of daddy and just have a meltdown. I want it! So, okay, shh, 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 shh. here you go. Now, next time she go to dad, he says no. Now, I'm going to hold my breath and stump my feet and lay out on the floor. Then dad says, mom, come get her. Then mom tries to touch her. By the time you know her, she hit mom. Mm. Yeah. Oh, maybe you need to go to a therapist. No, you need to exercise these principles. <laughs> you ain't got to call your mother because your mama going to tell you you need to spank that behind. You ain't got to call no, no counselor. You ain't got to wind up on Dr. Phil. You ain't got to wind up on Judge Judy or whatever. 
No, start right here in your home. This fifth commandment. I'm going to get the stick out of the fifth commandment. Obey my parents. Because I want your life to be prosperous. I want your, your life on this land to be long. I want your life on this land to be full of hope and glory. I want your life on this land to be full of the blessings and the promises of God. I want your generation, the next generation that you produce, not to have this curse of caring after you and stuck on you and holding you and, 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 and hindering you from moving forward. That's my responsibility as your parent, not your friend, not your, not your roommate, not your buddy, none of that. I'm your parent. You can, you can hate me today, but love me tomorrow because I promise you, your soul is more important than you loving me and caring about what I have to say. Your soul is so more important than that. So as your parent, you can dislike me all you want to, Karen, Bobby, Debbie, Alize, Mercedes, Shanika, Jane, Little Bobby, Big Bobby, Buki, whatever. All of them. Shanae. It's our responsibility. So when they say it takes a village, I would challenge that to a point. Because the village starts in your home. Your village starts in your home. When a 12-month-old baby can say, stop. That's your light right there. Wait a minute. Did they tell me to stop? Yeah. Wait a minute. You told me to stop. We think it's cute. Oh, they said stop. No. That's that defiant spirit already. Remember, we are born into sin. We didn't come here perfect. We what? We didn't have the Adam and Eve experience. We, Mary wasn't our mother. She didn't carry us in perfection. We were born into sin. And when we were born into sin, whatever generational curses that haven't been broken us, we were born into. And we have to recognize those things. We have to recognize them. I told my children when they were growing up, three things I have to do for you legally and morally. Have to provide a home for you. It can be a cardboard box. The law doesn't say what a home looks like. I have to provide food for you. Doesn't say what kind of food. And I have to give you clothing and an education. Doesn't dictate what it, what it looks like. Everything else are extra. So when you disrespect my home and me as the authority of God, I'm the representative of God. Now I'm going to turn your world upside down. I'm coming in your room and I'm taking out the PlayStation, the radio, the Mac. Oh, we're going to go. Oh, we'll go down and take everything off down to the sheets. And I'm not going to lock your door because that's my door. I might take it off the hinges. But you don't get to dictate the officer that God has placed over you. As a representative of him. No we're not going to do that. And if you feel that way. If you really feel. That you need that you can't operate here. There's the door. And you can't take nothing with you. Because you don't own nothing. See that's the other part. We try to give them all this stuff. Here take this baby. No no no. Grab a brown paper bag. Cut it out for your head and arms. And get to walking down the street. I remember years ago, my oldest daughter, she was at the age of feeling herself. And I told her to do something and she didn't want to do it. And she kept calling me at work. And my children know, unless it's an emergency, don't call me at work. I came home. She was telling me what she wasn't going to do. And blah, blah, blah. I said, OK. So I choked her out. She called the police. Now, I'm, I'm one of these parents. You come, you, you come into the womanhood space. The grown woman space, that's how you're going to be. That's what you're going to receive accordingly. Now, if she came in my space as a little girl, it had been something different. But when you're telling me, all, you know, all the head rolling, I'm, I'm going, we're going to be, you're going to get dealt with. So she calls the police on me. I, I was ready. I was waiting. 
Because I knew, I knew it was eventually it was coming. So the two officers come in. One was African-American. One was not. She said, what's going on? Caucasian officer says, oh, my God. Black officer goes, what's going on? So my daughter tells her. So she said, uh-huh. So the white officer, well, ma'am, you black officer's like, mm -mm, no. She said, you have a room by yourself? My daughter said, she said, let me see. My daughter goes up and she says, that's a nice house. You got nice stuff. I said, I'll tell you what, officer. Since y'all trying to make a decision, I'll make it for you. You can take her wherever she needs to go. I will sign papers for her. But what she's not going to do in my home is run this house because I am responsible for her spirit and her soul. I am. I have other children that are watching. I have to teach the lesson. The lesson has to be consistent. If I say it for one, I'm going to say it for the other one. If you go to jail, I am bailing you out. If you're there because of something that you did on your own, you just there. My message has to be consistent. My performance has to be consistent. My daughter understood from that point on, what I say is what I mean, and I'm going to show you I'm in control. Did it hurt my heart as a mother? Absolutely. When all the kids went to sleep, I broke down and cried. But I had to do what I needed to do because as her parent, I could see the writing on the wall. I know if I had not put that boundary up, my daughter was headed for serious trouble. Serious trouble. So I had to let her know. And I told the officer, I put my hand around her throat. I needed her to understand and to appreciate air. She needed to understand air. Uh huh. She needed to appreciate air. She needed to appreciate. She needed to appreciate the clothes on her back. I wanted her life to flash before her for a second. She needed to appreciate her siblings, her family, everything that was important to her. I wanted her to experience that. And now we had an understanding. So I told the officer, if that meant that you take me to jail, that's fine. But my position will not change when I come back. It's still going to be the same. Am I going to apologize to her? No. I don't owe you an apology. Why do I have to sit down and reason with you? What measure of life and experience do you have? So children, when you think that your parents owe you tons and tons of conversations and, and explanations, you would be wrong. Y'all hear me out there? Y'all wrong. Now, if a parent want to say, let me explain to you why I did what I did. That's something different. Let me go back and reiterate why, why we're doing these things, why we're putting these things in place. But for you to feel like if your father says to you, uh, didn't I say don't take my car without asking me and you take the car anyway, you don't think there should be a repercussion? That's theft. He can, he can just call the police and say my car was stolen. Maybe some of us need to do that. See, we develop little Karens. And then y'all, we go to the judicial system and want them to deal with our Karen or our kin or whoever it is. Or the Karen never has been dealt with. And then when somebody in customer service tells them no, the world comes to an end. So the only way they know how to respond is like a child because they're delayed in their maturity and in their thinking. Their spirit has not been nurtured and brought up in the fear and admiration of God. They have not been taught to respect authority. My dad used to tell me all the time, all five of us, I can put you someplace where a man with a dress on and a, and a hammer will tell you what to do. He's not going to ask you. He's going to point his finger and say, this is where you're going to go, and this is what's going to happen. And guess what? That's where you're going to go. You think they negotiate with you? Nope. Absolutely not. Parents are here to be representatives of God. We have to come against their spirit of caring. It is embarrassing to see adults, and it's more pervasive in women than there's in men, but it is embarrassing to see 
this continuum. It's so bad now where they, they are putting people in jail. Like, come on. You just lose control? Are you that out of control because somebody for, for having a temper tantrum, an adult temper, and then you're going to put your hands on people? I mean, you're throwing stuff at people, climbing over stuff, screen, people trying to go on vacation on the, in the airports, and they can't even go on vacation. I mean, how? but this is society's fault, too. Because they come against authority. They don't, if society could, they would get them, do away with parents. They would just, they would just let children just walk around. Raise themselves. Look at the, pay attention. See how the laws are changing. They start out quietly with the gun laws. See, we were all asleep when they did that. When that was a backdoor deal. I'm not even old enough to drink, but I can go buy a gun. And as a police officer, I'm telling you to put your gun down so I don't have to kill you and relive that in my mind. But no, because I have a right as an 18 year old. An 18 year old knows nothing about life. Nothing. They just happen to be 18. They can't even tell you why they happen to be 18. Most of them say they don't have to live in my parents' house anymore. But you're not an adult legally till you're 21. You can vote, mm, okay. You go to the service, but you're not considered a legal adult. The mind, the brain, for doesn't even develop fully until you start till you're about 25. <laughs> of right and wrong, females develop quicker in that area than males do. Males continue to grow to their 29. So how in the heck do you know something about life at 18? I don't care how smart, see, we're raising up smart children, but we're not raising up knowledgeable children. They don't have any common sense. No common sense. Book sense is not going to get you anywhere. It's not going to get you anywhere. Book sense is not going to do it. Because see, Google ain't going to tell you to obey your parents. It's going to tell you, you have a voice, you have a say-so, pack your bags and you can leave. I heard something that, that uh, Steve Harvey said to a young lady, and I agree with him. She asked a question. She said, I'm 18. I'm in college. I'm living at home with my mom. And oh my gosh, I'm trying to reason with her because she wants to control my life. She wants to tell me when to come and go and blah, blah, blah. And Steve was listening to her. He said, do you have a job? Do you pay for your own car payments? Do you put groceries in the house? He said, you see how quiet she got? Because that's no. So you don't have a say so over your life. You are still under the authority and protection of your mother. When you get there, then you can leave your mother's house. And you can keep your thoughts in your room. I just tell my children, you don't own nothing in here. Nothing. Even if they were working, I don't care. You don't own it. If they work, they had to contribute. You, you ate the groceries you bought. That was yours. OK, but no, if you want your own space, your own closet with your clothes, there's the door. I love you. I hope everything works out for you. I'm not going to be your crutch because you're disobedient. Don't call me when your rent is due. Because I, you haven't been here long enough to, for, for me to teach you consistency. See, when you're 18, you're just learning about consistency and responsibility. The spirit of the caring will send you to hell, children. The spirit of disobedience will send you to hell. And it is an immediate effect. It has an immediate spiritual and physical emotional effect. You know how? Because God has given everybody a consciousness. We know the difference between right and wrong. When you're doing something wrong, either you, you're uncomfortable, your heart might start racing, your hands might sweat, you're looking all around, you're paranoid. So, so, so you know you've done wrong. Now you wonder who knows that I've done wrong. And as parents, we have to save you from yourself. My youngest son, when he was growing up in high school, and when he was in college, he was doing some stuff. I knew he was doing it because the Holy Spirit showed me. And I, he would come home from school sometimes. I would be like, so why did you do this, this, and another? 
Mama, how'd you know that? Discernment, son. I have to know these things to, to help you to save yourself from you. Because I'm going to tell you something. The streets ain't going to love you like your parents. They're not going to love you. You owe somebody some money in the streets. They're coming to find you. They don't care about your excuse. They don't care about what you don't have. They're going to take. They're going to put their hands in your pockets and they're going to take your money, your shoes, and might take your life. They don't care about the boundary. See, there's the dog eat dog world. E A T. The dog eat dog world. It is a position of authority. I'm going to one up you to show you who I am. Because you was a disobedient child. So here, here's the street law. Here's the law of the land. I'd rather be at home and safety under the authority of my parents who are under the authority of God. And children, when you're old enough at the age of accountability spiritually, God holds you accountable for your actions. He holds you accountable for your thoughts. He holds you accountable for things you do, you say, you go. He holds you accountable. When you can understand certain things spiritually, you're at the age of accountability. So when pastors are teaching you all and telling you all things, they're not saying it just to hear themselves talk. When your parents are telling you, sit up, be quiet, wake up, do this, do that, they're not saying that it's exhausting. They don't want to, they don't want to hear themselves keep talking. They're telling you because they love you like God loves us. See, God is our father and he talks to us. Don't do that, daughter. Don't go there. So as parents, now we have to say, telling you the same thing. Don't do that, son. Don't be with that friend. Everybody is not your friend. Some people are just your acquaintance. And as children, you have to know the difference. A friend is somebody who's going to tell you the truth. They're going to love you. That's a, that is a place of honor. That is not an assumed place. I told my children they were in school. Nobody in your school is your friend. Nobody. They're an acquaintance. You develop friendship over years. Your friend becomes your brothers. They're not going to let you do anything wrong. But it starts at home. Obey your parents. You want your days to be long on this earth? Do y'all? Young man in the blue shirt. You want your days to be long on this earth? You want the promise that God has for you in your life? Obey your parents. Love them, respect them, hold them in high regard. And you think misbehaving is not, is just the only way you can dishonor them. No, speaking negatively of them, speaking down to them, talking about them, is dishonoring your parents. It's disobeying your parents. And those who stand in the place of parents, because I understand there are children who are in foster care, who've been adopted. But those are still the people that God has said, these are going to be your parents. And we touched on it earlier. What if my parent wasn't a good parent? What if I have to live with a grandparent? Those are your parents. We don't choose who our parents are, unfortunately. We don't get that choice. I'm quite sure if I had that choice, I'd you know, be sitting in a mansion somewhere. But even with all the money you can have, still run. Look, look at the Smith family. Those those kids are messed up. Yeah, they are. They're messed up. Yeah. They're messed up. I, I think, Co Pastor, you put something on on internet or on your message about who cares about Johnny Depp because there are so many other things going on in the world. Yes. But see, their behavior is indicative of not listening to parents or poor parenting. That, that's what that's from. Manipulation. Dysfunction. All starts here. We don't address it. We see it. Sometimes we're like, what is that? You better get that rod of correction out. Pray over it. My dad used to tell me it's going to hurt me more than it's going to hurt you. And then he would talk to us about the importance of obeying my parents and what God says about it. So today I'm wrapping up. I want you all to understand the pervasiveness, the pervasiveness of the spirit of a caring. Don't be in that category. Don't let us see you on YouTube or 
uh, one of these other media's platform acting a plum fool. Because yeah. I'm one of these people. If I see you and I know you, I'm going to call you out where you misbehave at. You on Facebook disregarding and disrespecting your, dishonoring your family. And I know you. And I know you know you. That's what we're going to deal with you at. See, as parents, we have to learn how to do that, too. If Johnny has a temper tantrum in Walmart, deal with Johnny in Walmart. Don't wait till Johnny get home because Johnny forgot about what I did. And you all the way home cussing, fussing at your kid. Don't you ain't got to cuss at you. The Bible tells us we're not to, especially fathers, you're not to break your son's spirit. We don't want to break their spirit. We just want them to know the rod of correction is coming. Because I have to. That's how I show you that I love you. So all of the stuff that we have allowed society to feed us on a silver spoon, child abuse. I'm not, and I, don't get me wrong, I'm not that downplaying child abuse because it's real. But we have to know the difference between abuse and discipline. We have to know the difference between abuse and discipline. This is like bullying. You have to know the difference between bullying and how children just develop and communicate. Because there are some parts of development that children will touch, will hit a child just to see what they're going to do. It's a part of development. There's a difference. That's how they communicate. So everything that little Johnny does, if he stepped on little Susie's foot, he might not have been trying to bully her. He might like her. He might not know how to communicate with a little girl. But we want to tag it. It's a bully. The bully spirit is the same spirit of the caring from being disobedient. Teach, parents go up to the school screaming holler at the teachers and then their kids scream holler at the teachers. They, where did they get it from? From you. They pull up to the drive through window, cussing the people out. Then they cuss the people out. Where did they get that from? From you. And then you, then you want to, well, we're going to pray tonight. Well, I'm confused. Do we pray or do we cuss them out? I don't know. Let your message be clear. Let your delivery be clear. Honor me and your days will be much in the land. Oh, the land is so rich. The land. See, that word land is powerful. That means real estate, wealth, development, roots, generation of safety. That's rich. That's rich. That's producing something. It's producing something valuable, important. But when we when we don't, my great grandparents were farmers. They had a fourth grade education. But my grandfather told me, and I would be out there helping him in the fall. That was our job. When we get out of school, we go out there and pick stuff. He used to pick up the soil and say, "See this? Smell it. This is what's valuable. You take care of it, they'll take care of you." Fourth grade education. He said, it's not that building, it's this. It's the land. So you want the, the land that God has ordained for you, has promised for you to produce. You want it to multiply. You want it to be a good report, a good production, generation and generation and generation. I pray tonight that you, to this evening, that you have. Receive something in Jesus name from this message. I will continue to pray for all the parents, grandparents and those who have the responsibility of parenting that you do it the way God called us to do it. Basic instructions before leaving earth, the Bible. And children, respect and honor your parents. In Jesus name. Amen.